Here is one of a series of talks by spiritual leader Lola McDowell Lee, spanning two decades from the early 70s through the 90s. Lola was a Zen Roshi, whose Rinzai lineage included Dr. Henry Plutov and renowned Zen master Shigetsu Sasaki. Lola was a religious scholar as well as an ordained Christian minister. While the talks are focused mainly on Zen and Buddhism, Lola drew on many spiritual traditions, including those of Jesus, Plato, Lao Tzu, the Hindu Vedas, Meister Eckhart, and Gurdjieff. Beyond the universe, which there isn't any beyond, you know, how in the name of common sense are you going to be one with it? There is no ladder that tall. Hmm? How are you going to reach it? If it is not right here, very present, huh? how would one ever find it? Well, maybe that's why so few people do. They've got it out there instead of right here. Now, in the experience of wholeness, of oneness, and this would be called unity. There is the union of what we call spirit and body or matter and consciousness. Hmm? Now, the average person finds this even difficult to think about. Hmm? If a person is divided within himself, how can he accept existence to be one? He who is integrated within himself can know then that existence is one and is indivisible. If you are divided, then you, you, because we do project ourselves, if you are divided, then the whole existence is divided. If there is an integration takes place in you, then there is a oneness. Huh? That makes sense, doesn't it? I can be logical. <laughs> hmm? When a child is born, it is not conscious of any differentiation between the body and the mind or the body and the soul. Hmm? As a matter of fact, it's not even aware of a differentiation between himself and his mother. Not for a while. Hmm? Body and soul. One existence. God and you. One existence. But as that little baby begins to differentiate... Out of necessity, hmm? just living on this planet, you know, we have a culture, we have a society, we look for our security. It teaches us to discriminate between the body and the mind. Hmm? When you look at yourself, we discriminate between inner self and outer self. Outer self is how we appear to somebody else and how we act in front of somebody else. And inner self, well, that's our private world. So, it, you know, we kind of try to hold things together and cope. Hmm? No. But we separate ourselves. Now, a child early on is taught self-restraint. Well, they used to be taught it more than they are now, I think. No? Self-restraint, in a way, is to act other than what he feels. Sometimes, huh? Yeah. And so we have a split. And everyone has this. If your parents didn't impose it on you, society did, and you imposed it upon yourself in order to fit in with your peer group. Self-restraint, huh? And so we're split. 
Everybody's a little bit skitsy. Yeah. But gradually, as we try to adjust to our environment, you know, this, 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 uh, the soul of us tries to adjust to our surround, huh? And so we gradually impose a power to control ourselves. It comes about very gradually. And there is then a gulf between the body and the mind. And now it's very difficult to feel one with existence because we have built put this wall between what's out there and what's in here in order to cope with ourselves. Difficult now to feel one with existence. If you find it difficult to be one with yourself, huh? how are you going to be one with a whole? You know, it begins here and it ends right here. Now, our deep-rooted duality rises with the body, first of all. We've got two eyes, so we see, you know, and so on. And it, 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 the body brings it about. We see far and we see near and high and low. You know, just the normal acts of seeing uh, bring it about. The very necessity of living in this world brings it about. So no blame. It, it exists, and we should cognize this. No blame. It is useful, it is necessary, but it is not the reality. It is a phenomenal reality in which we ex live. It is not the essential reality, the essence of it all, huh? And we should also remember in looking at this that it is not necessary that everything that is useful in life is the truth. Something is useful, period, end of report. It's useful. So you look at that, you accept that, and you go on, and you go deeper and deeper and deeper within yourself, not beyond yourself, deeper within yourself. Now, it is necessary to learn self-restraint and to have forbearance, you know, to be patient with people and, and to look kindly at them and so on and so on. To be able to control yourself, to live in the society, is necessary. And we can go a little bit further and we can say that this self-restraint that has been imposed upon us can also become a self-discipline which we impose upon ourselves, but with a different point of view a little bit, huh? It is not a uh, self-restraint as to living and coping with our daily chores and all that sort of thing. It is a self-discipline to find out what is going on. And we live in this world within, and we look first at the thinking, our intellect, and then we look at the desire, you know, and it seems to us that the, the thinking and the desire, you know, they're both trying to assert their own requirements. You know, it's look at me, 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 look at me. Both ends of the stick, you know. And so no wonder we're in conflict. And yet Lao Tzu says, you know, be non-assertive in your governing. Mm. How neat it would be to be so self-disciplined that you could allow the both, really, now and then, to be just dissolved. Hmm? Instead of always living with this inner struggle, you can let them both go. And then you pick them up again. And then you let them go. 
Hmm? That's self-discipline. Now, there are some psychologists who say that at an early age, we are taught, we pick it up if we're not taught it by society. Our culture is such. We begin to look at that part of the body which is below the waist as the lesser part of us. Hmm? We think of it as inferior. We sort of have... Not so much today, I think, is, is in the past, but this is uh, inferior and this is superior. Hmm? You know why? We have established an identity with the upper part. Huh? Our recognition is connected with the intellect and seeing our feelings, and so this is what's important. Instincts... Hmm. Hmm? Hmm. From the waist up, we're important. And the rest of it is kind of like, well, it's a vehicle of, or it's a victim of, or whatever, of desire. So we'll just turn our backs on that and be oriented right here. Right there, you know, then we can whip the world. Hmm? And this, of course, has some far-reaching effects also. Because now we've got blockages, because we must stay up here. And that brings about more and more conflicts just to keep this thinking in its proper place. Now let us say that we could, uh, this body, this body, Even do this is the senses, huh? The sense of touch. Senses. Supposing you could bring together the senses and the thinking. Supposing in just one, almost as if it were an embrace of unity. They were together. Well, it'd be quite an experience, wouldn't it? Body and mind, one. Well, let's see what we can do about it. Hmm? One begins, first of all, not so much to look at the thinking. You've been doing that quite a while now. Look at what the senses are reporting. Look at how they are reporting. When you look at a flower, what are the senses reporting? Huh? The eye gate. What does it? What does it? What, what is it reporting? You close your eyes and always oh, doing this and this and this and this, this. But when you just look at the flower first, how does it affect you? Never mind what you think. How does it affect you? You know, that it's beautiful, that's beside the point. That's another area we can reach that conclusion very rapidly in our thinking. Mm -hmm. But just what the senses are reporting, and then how does it affect you? When the sun rises in the morning, mm -hmm. how does it affect you? Are you filled with a kind of exuberance and exhilaration in the freshness of a new day? Well, first of all, you have to get up early enough. Yeah. And if you can't do that, look at the moon at night. Huh? There is a mystery to the moon. How does it affect you? You know, we, have, we, we are so intellectual, so thinking, that we don't even recognize this, this tremendous mystery of the moon. And we walk out, oh, the moon is bright tonight, isn't it? It's almost like day. Oh, it's dark out, the moon must be gone, or it's just a sliver or something like that. But the, the, the moon is, is, is majestic, and it's, uh, it's mysterious. The sun is bright, and, you know. Be 
maybe the, the, in a way the two aspects of a day. There is the, the masculine, which is the bright and the outgoing, and then there is the mystery of the feminine. The movement. Hmm? So little by little, now, sensitivity has become a thing in our modern world. The classes are given to teach sensitivity, learning to touch and how it affects you. Uh, now, sensitivity rises in the body, not in your mind. But if too much of a gulf has risen, uh, and the sensitivity is lost, you know, they gradually have become dull because you haven't paid any attention to them. Then the intellect is left uninformed. Hmm? Where do you think this word I has come from? Hmm? Out of the sky, it came out of your body. Yeah. And when you are no longer sensitive to your senses, you know, there is a poetry that is missing. The music is missing. See? It's like the fragrance of, listen, li of living is all dried up. Yeah. You watch a child, little baby, when a baby sits there for maybe the third time or something that is in a high chair and he eats, it's not only that his body eats, his soul gets a pleasure out of it. Huh? Yeah. And when a little child dances, you know, his soul dances with the body. And when he runs, his soul runs with him. Integrated. You should try just walking with the soul. Huh? Then you would finally be walking in meditation. Huh? Yeah. And we walk with the thinking. We don't walk with the soul. Hmm. You know, senses do marvelous things. And if they're dull, then you, the mind gets a little dull, too. Because the intellect has no direct means of its own. It's dependent on the senses. The senses, one could say, are the gates of intelligence. And the body is the medium of the soul. The body represents the soul. And if we become enemies of our body, of our senses, we cut our connections. Now, Lao Tzu says, duality forms within us because of this disparity between the senses and the intellect. So, we have this space or this distance between me and existence. Yeah. Distance, there are times when it should be. Because in distance, something is objective. And there are times when this distance should be broken. When something is objective, you can look at it. Now, do you, do you actually look at what the senses are reporting every now and then? When your foot hits the floor, what's going on? People have a habit, you know, of running up and putting their arms around me. What's happening when you do that? Are you just trying to out on the me, or is there something happening? Something's happening, and you should be aware of it. 
And so, you know, it is said in, in practically all religions, you become as a little child. So that sensitivity is still there. Huh? Bring it back. Child is sensitive. So we could say that the child lives in Advaitya, hmm? this integrated state. But with a child, it is an ignorant Advaitya. Hmm? The wise come again to the Advaitya of a child. But it is now born out of wisdom and not ignorance. Hmm? The innocence of a child. Is magic up to something out there? He's dragging the buckets away. <laughs> oh, that's what you call a dog's life. <laughs> Having fun. <laughs> Well, anyway, the ignorance of a child is, uh, the innocence of a child is mostly ignorance, huh? It doesn't know yet this I, and so this gulf hasn't come about. This state of innocence has to be reattained. But now it is an innocence that results from awakening. An awakened state of innocence has to be established. And you can't just turn around and say, I feel innocent. That's feeling. That's not being awake. Hmm? The Advaitya of the child is not his achievement. When it is reestablished by the awakening, by the return, it is richer and it is sounder, it carries a dignity, and it is full of awe. If you can imagine innocence being full of awe. Yeah. But then you see, the knower has become known. should be done so that the embrace can take place in us, this unity. Mm -hmm. How can be we be one within? Well, Lao Tzu had a method. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, whether you're standing, or you're sitting, or you're sleeping, or you're listening, or you're talking, or you're walking, you should be immersed in the acting. You be one with every move you make. If you're walking down a road, become the walking. It's not I walking, it's walking. Don't let the mind wander off into a world all of its own and so you're separated. There should not be any difference between you and the act. You raise your arm. Come on, raise your arm. Yeah. Are you in it? Or did you just direct it up? You ordered it to go up. Huh? So... You raise your arm, and where are you? Hmm? Just sitting there giving orders. Where are you? Yeah. So allow yourself to become absorbed in raising the arm. Hmm? And, you know, this, this old thing out of the Upanishads, you know, the individual motion becomes the universal movement, or vice versa. The motion... <laughs> what is it, Rosalind? <laughs> well, I think you can also say the individual movement is the universal motion. See? You move your arm, 
The whole universe moves. All of it. The total of it. Yeah. So that there is that old problem. When you sneeze, how come it affects the lion in Africa? And it does. No. Yeah. Neither awareness nor witnessing, but one. You become the act itself. When you eat, become the eating. When you look, become the looking. Well, look. You see, you all followed an order. <laughs> Huh? Whatever you do, do it so totally, so completely, wholeheartedly, that you're just one with the act. That there is just the act. Hmm? There should be no division between the act and the actor. You know, you all know the story of the old Roshi over there. And somebody came along and asked him, you know, now that you have attained enlightenment, what's the difference between how you are now and what you were then? And his answer? I carry water, I chop wood. The total embrace of body-mind. And we call it they call it, in the Eastern religion, Tantra. Hmm? Now, the mind usually is called the masculine aspect of the human being. And the body with its senses and its feelings and its mystery, the feminine aspect. The masculine must find the feminine and embrace it. And the feminine must find the masculine and embrace it, and you become one. Hmm? In the woman, the masculine is the hidden. In the man, the feminine is the hidden. And you know, in the Gospel of St. Thomas, Jesus says, when you make the two as one, the male and the female into a single one, then you shall enter the kingdom. Hmm? Yeah. When one is so completely, so wholeheartedly, one with an act, I is no more. There is the universe. Now, how can we help ourselves to bring this about? Yeah. Well, now, if you can, if you have the opportunity, observe a child sleeping. As a child sleeps, you will observe that the abdomen rises and falls, rises and falls as he breathes. Mm -hmm. In an adult, because of our necessities of living, of coping with our life and so on, the seat of the breath has changed from the abdomen to the chest. Now, there is a Japanese word for this initial source of breath, and that is tendon. Right breathing is connected with the tendon, which is located in this particular area. This area? Let me see this area. Yeah. Below the navel. Yeah. When you're filled with anxiety and tension, your breath becomes rather rapid and short, and it comes now from the chest. And, you know, we in the West, we have these concepts, you know, that's our society. You're supposed to have a big chest, you know, breathe. <laughs> big chest, flat stomach, you know, little ways. That's our culture. Yeah. Now, you've seen pictures of the Buddha, and Hotai, <laughs> big stomachs. <laughs> Breathe deep. Hmm? It's not 
necessary that you go out of your way to cultivate this particular, uh, well, you know, there, there are certain exercises you can do to, to make it more so. Huh? You don't have to do that. You know, but you can learn to breathe right. We don't question, hardly ever do we question, <clears throat> that it is the mind. It's our brain, which is the organ of the psyche, or the thinking, you know. And here comes the thinking and the planning, and it gives orders. Hmm? Yeah. But one should see, you know, you don't question that. The mind gives you orders. But one should begin to look at the abdominal muscles, the, the tendon, as a partner in this thing. If the tendon isn't working, the plans usually fall short. They're not really carried out into action. And you know, it's like they say, you can't produce a piece of music just by sitting there and staring at the score. Huh? Something else has got to take place. And when you breathe from the tendon, mental power is increased. Spiritual power comes into action. The effect of using the abdominal muscles is reported to the brain. And so now further orders can ensue. Mental action is exercised. Now, if you want to get smarter, huh? By a process of from here to here and from here to here. You know, the Greeks, they knew this. And they were, I heard about something on TV the other day, you know, that, and there is a little segment of uh, something in here, a little bitty thing. The cells in this are the same as the cells in the brain. So, and the Greeks called this the diaphragm, the diaphragm, where we get that word, diaphragm. And what is up here, it conquers everything, so it's called hephren. So from hephren to diaphragm to diaphragm to hephren. This is, this is the circuit. Hmm? Now, when you laugh, you know, to your emotional expression, when you laugh, when you have anger, when you're sorrowful, you use these muscles. You know, I've been told that if you bury somebody in sand up to their necks, you can sit there and tell them funny stories, and I mean the funniest of stories, till you're blue in the face, and they can't laugh. They don't even think the funny the stories are funny because they're shut off. Hmm? Man uses his body to think, to get angry, to cry, to feel joy. And, you know, the relationship has been likened to something. There's a general staff up here. Huh? And then he's got soldiers in the field, all the senses and everything. Huh? No matter how expert that general staff may be, no battle can be won without the troops. Hmm? Yeah. And you've watched yourself, you know, in very crucial moments. You know, in the, even in meditation, I can tell you. In meditation, when all of a sudden this experience begins to engulf you and take you over. You know, it's almost, the breathing becomes very shallow, very short, almost seems to stop. Yeah? A circus performer knows this when he goes out on the tightrope. All of a sudden, huh? Yeah. A potter throwing a bowl on the wheel knows this. An artist unconsciously holds her breath when drawing an accurate fine line. Hmm? In the tea ceremony, in judo, in kendo, in tai chi, you know, the tendon, it takes the lead of the movements of the body. Look at, look at your thinking. Look at your brain, your mind. You know, the brain doesn't know how to manage all these wandering thoughts. 
You've sat long enough to know that. You're trying to fight the thoughts with the thoughts all the time. Huh? The liberty of the mind can't manage that. But bring this into the picture and really get settled with this, then the circuit is complete. There's no thinking here. Hmm. <clears throat> Now, the, the, the word tendon has been uh, translated as lower abdomen, but it's a lot more than that, huh? It's just not the lower abdomen. The tendon also signifies spiritual power. If you say abdominal muscle walls or something like that, what's that? Everybody's got something. It doesn't mean anything, huh? So tendon, Yeah? Now, within this area called tendon, within these abdominal walls, hmm, there is a center, and that center is called hara. Now, hara is a Japanese word, and that's translated as stomach, which is a very poor translation, just like tendon is. Huh? Yeah. Now, I'm sure you've heard of the term harakiri. No? We take it to mean suicide. No? But in the Japanese, it means more than that. Hara is the center. It is the supreme center from which springs breath and life. If you can really get into this center, you will know what your breath is. You will know what life is. Hmm? Breath and life are born in you in a particular... You know, the baby... From this area is connected to its mother, for its life. Huh? Now in Japan, when one slices himself or stabs oneself, slicing is what they do in this center, he, they say, well, he committed harikiri. But not everyone can commit harikiri. Because in order to really commit harikiri, the hara has first to be recognized. Other than that, it's suicide. The harakiri is something else. Hmm? This this hara, this neutral center, you focus on it. It's neutral. It's neither feminine nor masculine, and it has nothing in it. it has nothing in it, as far as you are concerned. But you focus, and it becomes uh, eventually like a like a flame of a lamp, you know, or a flame of a candle. Something becomes seated in it. Hmm? Then you can call it hara. So it's more than stomach. Yeah. Now, when this flame has become lit in this center, yeah, then it can merge with the uh, we can say the eternal flame. When the consciousness embraces everlasting light, and that doesn't take any thinking. As a matter of fact, you cannot think it. All it takes is discipline. Yeah? So now Lao Tzu goes on to say, when he has cleansed away the most mysterious sights of his imagination, he can become without flaw. Well, we do not know how many kinds of webs we have woven. Hmm? How many tigers are lurking around? Hmm? How many webs, not only in just in the name of samsara, with this daily world existence, huh? but also the webs that we have woven of what we call nirvana or enlightenment. We weave webs of illusion. And they're great. We have such fun doing this. Yeah? 
We have such satisfaction doing this. It appeases us. Makes us seem brighter and smarter and more loving and more caring. Hmm? The general staff really works. Yeah. Through meditation, one can become disillusioned. Hmm? To have the illusions wiped away through insight. We have created countless gods and countless heavens and countless hells with our imagination. And in all this creating that we have done with the imagination, all these webs, what have you really known? What have you really realized? Our imaginations make use of, of memories in the most astounding manner. Hmm? It's like we've got a library where we've collected all kinds of illusions and the imagination uses them all to create new ones. Oh, it's a beautiful affair, huh? And all of these cobwebs reside somewhere in that psyche. Now you can work and work and work and work and work and work and work with, with yourself to get rid of these webs, and you should. But what about the ones that you do not even see? Hmm? People do try to achieve this intellectually. But you know, one logic can be defeated by another logic, and then another logic, and then another logic. One concept can be overcome by another concept, and they can be overcome by the third concept, and that can be overcome by the fourth concept. Yeah. Then you just move from concept number one to the grips of this, to move into the grips of the second, to move into the grips of the third, to move into the grips of the fourth, huh? and on and on and on and on and on. Our webs of illusion. And you know, so people, they go from one religion to another, they go from one guru to another, and they are under the illusion that they have left all this other stuff behind them. And they don't know they're bringing it right with them. Huh? Unless you step out of the center of the imagination, you're going to keep right on weaving webs, and you're going to use all this old stuff to help you weed the webs that you think you are correct now with the, anything new that you've heard. <clears throat> but what is the imagination going to use except what's already in here? Hmm? Now, how to jump out of this imagination? How to, you know, and people say, well, I'm not going to think about this anymore. I'm not going to feel, you know. Now, how to jump out of the imagination without getting all emotional? Yeah. When people move from thinking to feeling, they get very, you know, they, they, they can even drown themselves in emotions. But that's still not the real thing. So Lao Tzu says, you go where? There is a place in you. You go where? There are no thoughts, no feelings, no knowledge, no devotion. Huh? Then the mind becomes flawless. See, only pure existence remains. The cobwebs of the imagination have been swept away. There weren't any tigers in the first place. <laughs> hmm? It always has been flawless. If you can breathe from the tendon, the ego steps aside. Now the ego, you know, it can observe and it can look into the tendon. If you keep breathing and concentrating the energy, and the pulling it together and pushing back with it, suddenly there is hara and no ego. You know, Lao Tzu used to test his students 
from time to time. He'd give them problems to work on, and they would bring him back the answers, and he would interview them, and he would say, I don't accept that. Hmm? He would put his hand on the tendon, and he'd say, you don't yet have the correct answer. Huh? Consciousness isn't here. You don't know. You don't really know. You know, there comes a change in breathing from here to here, and there's a change in you. As your breath becomes deeper and the more and more penetrating, you know, curtains lift. Mysteries reveal themselves. They reveal themselves. And you never thought of that? You don't have to sit there and figure them out. They reveal themselves, all by themselves. Huh? Doors open. You didn't even push. What lies hidden and within the individual extends and spreads itself out into a vast world. But you are that vast world. Hmm? Old adages, you know, we've heard from day one. As above, so below. Huh? What's in the body is in the universe. And it was Plotinus who said, you know, a man is a measure of all things. See? Man is a miniature, vast universe. He's not just an object running around out here. Whatever is in the universe exists in man. Whatever. <clears throat> When one reaches into one's own center, deep, there is the universal. Yeah. Now, Lao Tzu's method is a little different than the Indian method. <laughs> Indian pranayama, you know, is based on the intellect. You're constantly giving orders, breathe in, breathe out. <laughs> you know, Lao Tzu's method is absolutely natural. It's not mind-oriented. It's nature-oriented. The body, mind, one. Hmm? Spirit, body. Instead of putting it up and down like that, do it this way. I'll get rid of some of that, huh? Body, mind. Hmm? One is the extension of the other, in a way. In one manner of speaking. The two ends are the same thing. The two ends of a stick. Same thing, huh? See? The body, so then we could say, is crystallized spirit. Yeah. Now, when this experience, you know, dawns on you, yeah, then the very stones carry the God nature. Hmm? Weeds and sticks and stones and snails and insects, huh? And flowers. All have God nature. You know, a long time ago in the primitive society, they used to carve statues, their versions of God, huh? out of stone. And you know, maybe they had a message. Hmm? If you can't see God in the stone, how are you going to see him in you? Hmm? You know, and there's that old... Very famous corn, very difficult. There is a rock in the garden, stone in the garden. That's a lot of meaning. People think because there's no sense organs in the stone and it doesn't have any desires and it can't think and it can't move around, it's dead matter. Yeah. And maybe these are the same people who run around and they meet somebody who knows or who they think knows <laughs> and they would say to that person, you eat? You know, you feel hungry just like everybody else. You shiver in the cold and you need a fan in the summer. The God within is really lost to them. There's an old Chinese saying, If intense cold strikes not to the bone, how can plum blossoms fragrant be? Huh? If you can see God in a piece of rock, there is nowhere where you cannot see him. And it's an all-embracing acceptance of life. Yeah. 
What comes, comes. What goes, goes. Yeah. And through this acceptance, you know, there is a serenity that comes about. And the serenity becomes, you know, like a childlike innocence. And in this innocent eye, the self sees everything, and the whole world is divine. Yeah. And now, may the peace and the power that passes all understanding hold us and keep us in the law of the Christ of consciousness while we are seemingly separate one from another. And I thank you very much. If you find Lola's talks valuable, more will be posted in weeks to come.